Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. My piece on the weekend was a decade after Lehman. And I concluded by saying bubbles are bursting just about everywhere. Um, I said, let me return to the Euro bond markets where Africa issued $81 billion worth of bonds over the last six years. These markets trade continuously. Essentially, these markets are a continuous scorecard on the credit worthiness of the issuer. It's a relatively recent phenomenon and something many policymakers will not have considered adequately. And I said balance sheets are maxed out. There are no more quaaludes, and policymakers will no longer be able to pop them. In prescribed doses, quaaludes promotes relaxation, sleepiness, and sometimes a feeling of euphoria. It causes a drop in blood pressure and slows the pulse rate. These properties are the reason why it was initially thought to be a useful sedative, an anxiolytic. It became a recreational drug due to its euphoric effect. Bubbles are bursting just about everywhere. And to that point, this is Charlie Bilello. Crypto versus fiat currency returns. I also said I digress. The point is we all live in the real time. Our faces pressed against a high-frequency screen. But a 10-year sweep in perspective is not something we afford ourselves in this seriously fluid and real-time world. According to the Financial Times, the pieces are falling into place, and that is why everybody feels so nervous. Um, this is about Theresa May. Her remarks were telling Britain's exit talks two years on from the referendum are entering a new and decisive phase. Leaders are lifting their sights to the finish line. The Brussels compromise machine is primed. All sides see a deal within reach. Possibly just eight weeks away, it's clear, says one EU diplomat, we're in the end spiel in the game. And Pascal Lamy said this is not a negotiation between the EU and the UK. This is a negotiation within London between Remainers and Brexiteers pound is at 131.50 and continues to trade higher on optimism. Home thoughts, magnificent sunrise in the El Bata plains of northern Kenya. Wishing you an equally beautiful week ahead. Photo by Andrew Peacock. That took me to WB Yates. The world is full of magic things. Patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. Chinua Achebe, but I liked Yeats, that wild Irishman. I really loved his love of language, his flow. This was the city of Nairobi yesterday at 6.48 a.m. WB Yeats again, I've spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. This is one of the beautiful, huge bull elephants we encountered in Ah, ooh, ah, ah. This one was in the area known as the small Serengeti. He cut his way through the long meadow grasses laden with delicate purple blooms. His testosterone fueled aroma drifting towards us ahead of his arrival. In many ways, the Persian leopard could be considered a symbol for the Kurds, persecuted, squeezed from all sides survivors finding refuge in the mountains and the wind among the reeds this is wb yates had i the heavens embroidered cloths and wrought with golden and silver light the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light i would spread the cloths under your feet but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams.
Political reflections, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un greets South Korean leader President Moon Jae-in with a welcome ceremony at Pyongyang Sunan International Airport. And the South Korean president, I think, has really kept the show on the road at times. Fate of 14 people on board unknown as Russian military plane goes missing off the coast of Syria. Um, the US and Washington believe the aircraft, which is an uh, ill 20 turboprop plane used for electronic re reconnaissance, was inadvertently shot down by anti aircraft artillery operated by Moscow's ally, the Syrian government. TASS said the plane was over the Mediterranean Sea, about 35 kilometers from the Syrian coastline. Um, the trace of the Il-20 on flight control radars disappeared during an attack by four Israeli F-16 jets on Syrian facilities in Latakia province, the statement was quoted as saying. At the same time, Russian air control radar systems detected rocket launches from the French frigate Auvergne, which was located in that region. Auvergne is talking of a causes belay. Putin to date in these sorts of scenarios has been quite um, circumspect. AP exclusive leaked docs show Julian Assange bid for Russian visa. Um, metadata suggests that it was on November the 29th, the day after the release of the first batch of US State Department files, that the letter for the Russian consulate was drafted on the Jessica Longley computer. Take it back to a piece I wrote in which I said timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks which drained Hillary Clinton's bona fides and her turnout and motivated Trump's. Japan challenges China with submarine military exercise in the South China Sea. A Japanese submarine joined a military exercise in the contested area of the South China Sea in a move that could infuriate Beijing which claims most of the disputed waters. This was the first time Japan's maritime self-defense force has confirmed a military drill by a Japanese submarine in the waters. Took me back to something that Shinzo Abe said at TCAT when I was in the room then, when he said Japan bears the responsibility of fostering the confluence of the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, he said. UAE offers a curious case study for scholars of international relations, a small state with a tiny population and historically little presence on the world stage, but with outsized and seemingly ever-expanding ambitions. Foreign policy of the UAE offers a curious case study. Uh, UAE has quietly become a rising military power in the Middle East since the watershed of the Arab Spring the UAE has pursued an increasingly assertive and interventionist foreign policy, the effects of which are most evident in the Red Sea Basin and the Horn of Africa. Here, the UAE has sought to become a major political actor, maintaining a formidable military presence, handing out lavish economic aid and taking on the role of kingmaker and peace broker. Today, the UAE operates ports in four of the seven countries bordering the Red Sea, Egypt, Somalia, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia, and military bases in Yemen, Eritrea, and Somaliland, has been ratcheting up its economic activities in the Red Sea Basin as well. Port deals, but elsewhere the UAE has employed more forceful measures in Yemen, for example. But why has the UAE shifted from being a buyer of security to a supplier of it? could be argued that the UAE's foray into East Africa is due to the importance of the Red Sea as a vital artery for the transportation of the country's hydrocarbon exports. Through its narrow choke points, the Suez Canal in the north and the Bab el-Mandeb Strait in the south, around 3.9 and 4.8 million oil barrels respectively flowed every day in 2016. Control of seaports, moreover, helps in opening markets, generating economic opportunities. 
and in times of conflict projecting military power. I wrote a piece on the 6th of August, which was about the Indian Ocean economy in a port race. And I said, as we scan the blue economy, it is worth appreciating that maritime shipping is the lifeblood of Africa, with over 90% of the continent's imports and exports transported by sea. Today, from Massawa, Eritrea, admittedly on the Red Sea, to Djibouti, from Berbera to Mogadishu, from Lama to Mombasa, to Tanga, to Bagamoya, to Dar es Salaam, through Bera and Maputo all the way to Delhi and all points in between, we're witnessing a port race of sorts. As everyone seeks to get a piece of the Indian Ocean port action, China, the BRI initiative, the Gulf countries who now appear to see the Horn of Africa as their hinterland, Japan and India to a lesser degree, are all jostling for optimal geo-economic geo positioning. Overlay the geopolitics, and it is worth noting that the geopolitics has become much more fluid. Fluidity has been engendered by the spectacular arrival of Prime Minister Abe in Ethiopia, which is landlocked, of course, but a key future taker of port facilities. International markets here are the details of Trump's planned 10% tariff hikes on $200 billion of Chinese imports and potential further levies of Beijing retaliates. The new expanded list of Chinese products subject to tariffs includes bovine semen. There goes this bull market, says David Inglis. China is not going to negotiate with a gun pointed to its head, said a senior Chinese official. Trump tweeted yesterday, tariffs have put the US in a very strong bargaining position with billions of dollars in jobs flowing into our country, and yet cost increases have thus far been almost unnoticeable, he said. If countries will not make fair deals with us, they will be tariffed. 9th of July, I wrote about this tariff wars, and really I was using the example of the chicky run and the rebel without a cause. And my view is it's, it's psychological as well. Trump is a fellow who likes to escalate. He does not back down. Um, and I also said to Sputnik, Trump's aggressive foreign economic policy is the signature success of this administration. It's highly effective. Trump can keep it up. It's working a treat. S&P 500 long-term chart still looking pretty solid. That's bespoke best. As I said over the weekend and previously, the dollar is seriously weaponized. The U.S. economy is blowing hot. The risk is that U.S. interest rates will go higher than the market is currently predicting. And I was saying, you know, the dollar was like a toy gun, which is suddenly metasized into an AK-47. The worry is what happens if it metasizes even further. Goldman Sachs says rising U.S. rates are boiling the frog risk assets, which was a choice way of saying what I was saying. Um, and uh, have a look at that. The U.S. 10-year yield popped about 3% to the highest since May. Um, as I said, my market was, uh, my article was about a decade after Lehman. I said the markets have been like a patient etherized upon a table for a whole decade. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 116.88, dollar index 94.48, Japanese yen 111.97, Swiss franc 0.9618, the pound 131.50, the Australian dollar uh, 0.7193, India rupees 72.465, South Korean won 11.2532, Rial 413.41, Egyptian pound 17.9190. And the rand still below 15 at 14.9276. Dollar index, I'm adjusting my stock to 93.80. We're currently at 94.48. Euro dollar, this chart is from T commodity. 116.87. I still looking, although everyone's turning bullish to fade the rally. Amazon saved again by the parabola closed on it. This is Pineco Macro. And it is a curve, each of them feels unmistakably it is the parabola they must have guessed once or twice guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky that shape of no surprise no second chance no return 
Fang, Jesse Felder, look at this chart. Gold, uh, last at 11.98.50. We've been doing a lot of work, 12.10 to about 11.90. Had a dip through that level, of course. The last time commercials were net long and large specs were net short gold was November 2001, when gold was sub $300. Um, this is Peter Brandt who's saying the chart is now constructive. Crude oil had a wobble, and it's wobbling this morning as well, $68.33. EM investors getting more selective. Turkish lira drops more than 2%. India rupee falls almost 1%. But Brazil, Real, or Argentine peso continue their rebound. That's Holger. Have a read of a piece I wrote a few weeks back called Cold Turkey about Turkey. Turkey's lira extended declines. Investors fear more political meddling. President Erdogan has called on Turkish authorities to look into CHP role in Espanyol. Average investors prefer a $1 Actis bid to the offers they're receiving from other Gulf-based entities. What a story. Sub-Saharan Africa, US is expressing concern about currency swaps between Africa and China. The new Sudanese Prime Minister is promising a shock approach to mend the economy. He will adopt a shock approach to address the imbalances in inflation and the exchange rate of pound. Reuters, a year after U.S. sanctions ended, Sudan's economy unravels. Restrictions on how much cash is available to commercial banks are among measures aimed at curbing rampant inflation and addressing an economic crisis that could derail President Omar al-Bashir's plan to extend his nearly three decades of power. Banks have not announced specific withdrawal limits. Some have fallen in recent weeks to as little as 500 Sudanese pounds, which is $17.12 a day. Another fellow who's just keeping his money in safe deposit, safe deposit boxes. Uh, at over 60%, Sudan's inflation rate is among the world's highest, while its currency buys fewer than half as many dollars on the black market. Um, intermittent shortages of fuel and food and the scrapping of bread subsidies in January, doubling the price through hundreds of thousands of protesters onto the streets. Central bank reserves $1.1 billion or lost just enough for seven weeks of imports. There was a moment of beautiful optimism at the end of last year when sanctions went away and we thought everyone is going to be all over us like a rash in terms of wanting to invest. But unfortunately, the local and domestic economic pressures and the challenges associated with that have far outweighed the benefits of the end of sanctions. Sudan Central Bank devalued its currency from 6.7 to about 30 pounds per dollar, but the black market rate is still low at about 42. There's no confidence in the political system and the economy, and it's driven a lot of people to put FX in their homes and mattresses and safes. This is the worst economic crisis we've ever faced. I'm afraid we're facing a total collapse of the economy. People have reached their maximum level of anger. You can expect anything after that. I don't know what they will do. Very interesting piece in the New York Times about PM Abbey. On the morning of his first day of school, when he was seven, Abbey Ahmed heard his mother whispering into his ears, you're unique, my son, he recalled her saying. You will end up in the palace, so when you go to school, bear in mind that one day you'll be someone which will serve the nation. After taking office, he officially ended two decades of hostilities with Eritrea, started loosening a tightly controlled state-run economy, pledged multi-party elections, began working to woo the government's most stranded, strident critics, saying the risks are millions of disaffected youth, widespread poverty, violent struggle over resources among Ethiopia's competing ethnic groups. Um, changes are a major departure for Ethiopia, which has long relied on a government model that resembles China's, emphasizing state-led economic growth and a suppression of political dissent. He has delivered, but if life doesn't change for everyone, people get impatient, people have unrealistic expectations. 
more than just changing the way Ethiopians run. Abby says he wants to change the way Ethiopians see themselves. Build bridges, break down walls is a constant refrain. We just blame each other, he said in the interview, barely conceding his distress. We just hate each other. He calls it group thinking. Abby became a Protestant. He speaks of the ideals of love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. It's not political language, it's religious language, observed FM Isaac. Um, Mr. Abbey said one of his biggest priorities for the Crown Prince was peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea and was governor, and that he also spoke to several African leaders. I'm not a king. My ultimate objective is to see democratic elections in Ethiopia. If that happened, I'll feel I fulfilled my objective. I wrote about him saying 90 or so days represent the most consequential arrival of an African politician on the African stage since Mandela walked out of prison blinking in the sunlight. I also said to really disrupt you have to move with lightning speed and that's what he's doing. However, rebels in eastern Ethiopia seeking a vote on self-determination. Um, uh, troubled gas-rich Somali region during landmark peace talks with Prime Minister Abiy's government. The plan by the Ogada National Liberation Front, which has staged a low-level insurgency in Ethiopia's east for more than three decades, comes as Abiy invites once banned opponents to take part in elections. The demands may aggravate a scramble for the region's energy resources, including natural gas reserves, the government estimates will eventually earn $7 billion a year. Interesting. However, at least 23 people died in, in a weekend of ethnic violence around Addis Ababa. Um, so it's a very volatile, fluid situation. Le roi Salman Darabis souhaité recoil le président Gwele. Gwele, King Salman of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia seemed to be running the show in the Horn of Africa. Zimbabwe's inflation rises to the highest rate in almost seven years. South African all shares down 5.39% this year. Dollar versus Rand 14.9276. I want to sell the rank. Egyptian pound 17.9185. Another emerging market bites the dust. Egypt's main stock index entered a bear market yesterday after falling more than 20% from its peak in April. Nigeria fired back at HSBC after the bank criticized the president. In a research note dated July 18, the bank said a second Buhari term raises the risk of limited economic progress and further fiscal deterioration, prolonging the stagnation of his first term, particularly if there's no move towards completing reform of the exchange rate system or fiscal adjustments that diversify government revenues away from oil. Nigerian all shares down 15.8%. Ghana stock exchange is up 6.93%. Barty Airtel has picked banks for London IPO of Africa Business, um, JP Morgan City and UBS. Um, uh, so that's an interesting development. The sources declined to comment on the valuation of the Africa operations, but the business represents just a quarter of the revenue of the listed entity, which is, has a $20 billion market cap. Petra Diamonds is owed about $25 million in value added tax refunds by Tanzania's government. And now uh, NASPERS is listing and unbundling its video entertainment business multi choice on the JSC. They've been coming under tremendous pressure from Netflix. Um, and NASPERS has largely become a Tencent tracker. This is um, uh, Ahmed Salim of Tenio Intelligence's perspective on Kenya, well worth reading. And this is what I was writing about, the bubbles are bursting just about everywhere. Now let me return to the Eurobond markets where Africa issued $81 billion worth of Eurobonds uh, in the last six years. These markets trade continuously. Essentially, these markets are a continuous scorecard on the credit worthiness of the issuer. It's a relatively recent phenomenon, something many policymakers will not have considered adequately. I was saying balance sheets are maxed out. There are no more quaaludes, and policymakers will no longer be able to top them. 
Kenya's finance minister, Henry Rota, says the country doesn't need the IMF facility. Sonko found 12 bodies of infants hidden in boxes at Tumwani Hospital. Makar brings surreal the shilling, 100.81. Nairobi all shut down 7.96% year to date. NSC 20 down 20% year to date. Kurama Capital has ruled out buying additional shares in Gen Africa asset managers after acquiring 90.84% for 2.84 billion shillings. Nairobi Polo Club chairman Mike Dutoit um, uh, promises you high action polo at the Kenya International Polo Tournament. Don't miss out white polo. Rather like the photograph, he looks terribly fetching. Very frontier evening, saw the body of a man who mistimed his run across the Mombasa Nairobi Road. Seventh fatality that the taxi driver's seen this year. Two power cuts and a belly dancer from the Urals in a Lebanese restaurant, Kenya, which is a restaurant which is just next door. Okay. That's Charlie Watson, and I'm going to need to be later on today. Once again, thank you for stopping by.